Awesome. I can hear myself, but I, you can hear me. That's, uh, welcome to 2022. Chat messages don't work, but microphones. So, and we lost our moderator, so I will act as the moderator and introduce us two. Yeah. You introduce the talk? Yeah. Good. All right. Welcome, everyone. Welcome to the talk on unlimited data science libraries using one container image and no installation. So let's start by introducing myself. I'm the guy on the right, um, HPC system administrator at Ghent University in Belgium. You can find me on GitHub, Twitter, and my email. I was supposed to give this talk together with Guillaume, but he can't make it, but we found a very good replacement. Okay. Yes, so I today jump into my Guillaume suit. Um, my name is Marcel Hilt. I'm working for the same company as Guillaume um, for Red Hat, and luckily I've been working on the same topic for the past three years as well, inside the office of the CTO of Red Hat on the topics of AI ops and machine learning. So. We'll have, this is our story arc today, the usual suspension curve. We start with some context and some background, then go into the problem and wonder what might be the solution to that problem. And then, if the demo gods are with us, we will have a wonderful presentation and a demo how we solve the problem, and then some links. So spare your photos. I mean, you can take photos, but all the links will be on the last slide. So the context is, as you might have guessed, since we're on the AIML track, data science. And one might ask, what is Red Hat, an infrastructure company, doing with data science? So that was the question that the office of the CTO also figured like three years ago. Somehow, all the infrastructure, all the Linux boxes, all the Kubernetes clusters out there will face different workloads mainly AI ML workloads, and these will become a major part of the workloads that will run on our infrastructure. So you need to have a slightly different approach to this kind of workload, and in order to make, that, make sure that it works well in this cloud-native context and on top of our products, we started, on this project called, started out on this project called the Open Data Hub. So not just to make sure that the workloads run, but also to use these uh, data science tools ourselves in order to make our products better and our projects better, and also to experience what it means in the age of cloud and cloud-native tools to work as a data scientist. And hands raised, how many people of you are consider yourself data scientists? There's a few. So how many people of yourself consider yourself a like DevOps SRE people supporting stuff? That's the majority of folks. So the typical data scientist works on his laptop because that's a controlled environment. You do pip install, you do tweak, tweak your installation. Sometimes you do a sudo pip install because you don't freaking care whether this is installed as a root, but it, you, it just should work, your libraries, right? And the data science, uh, the, the, the cloud-native approach to this is a little bit different. So you go to your browser and you do your stuff. So at that point, we figured let's create an operator, a, a distribution, a best-of-breed distribution of the most common data science tools and move them into a cloud-native context, which is OpenShift or Kubernetes, and use them and improve the user experience for using these tools, which is different, right? Open Data Hub itself is a sort of a meta operator. It pulls in different other tooling and installs it. So if you see Kafka or Kubeflow or TensorFlow or Spark there, we're not reinventing the wheel and creating operators for Spark, but we're pulling in these operators from other communities so that it's all very well integrated. So you can just start out with installing Open Data Hub, and boom, you have an environment to try out data science inside your browser on, to on top of your Kubernetes cluster. So this is the shameless plug that I managed to sneak in 
as a as a uh, return for my job in replacement, you can try out this Open Data Hub installation on the Operate First Cloud, which is my next project, where we're deploying tools and tooling and clusters into a community cloud where it's easy to use. So with your GitHub handle, with your GitHub account, you can log into the Operate First Cloud, and you can try out Open Data Hub there just as we speak. Obviously, this also flows into Red Hat products. So Open Data Hub itself was productized some months ago as Red Hat OpenShift Data Science, or short ROADS. You can consume it as a service on cloud.redhat.com, um, which runs on OpenShift Dedicated, which is our managed OpenShift environment. And you can not just use it, and try it out on a, on a link that we'll have at the end of the presentation. But you can also integrate with ISVs, which, which are sometimes not a part of the ODH distribution. So you will not just get um, the open data up bits and pieces, but also integrations with um, some other vendors integrated into this cloud environment. So much for the cloud native pathway of a data scientist. Now the data scientist faces even more problems, which Kenneth will talk to. Oops. OK, thanks a lot for covering that. I'm very happy I didn't have to do that myself. Um, my background is very different. As I mentioned, I'm an HPC system administrator. So HPC is short for high performance computing, um, also known as supercomputing. Um, and that's really large scale infrastructure dedicated for doing heavy duty computing with lots of special stuff around it, fast network, GPUs, large shared file systems, so we're talking petabytes of, uh, of storage space. And what's also very typical is that you have multiple, typically hundreds or even of thousands of users that have access to this system. Um, HPC clusters nowadays are definitely used by way more scientists than uh, was the case before, so the traditional workload is simulations like weather, climate, um, physics simulations, things like this. But this is really opening up now to a, a larger variety of workloads, artificial intelligence, machine learning, data science. So it's really opening up. Um, and we're seeing, seeing a big influx of uh, additional users. Of course, there's a strong focus in high performance computing on the performance of uh, the workloads that are being run. And you just want to you, you get the best possible, um, let's say, use of the compute power that you have available, not only to make a single simulation faster, but just to get more simulations done in the same amount of time. Maybe you know this already, but basically any supercomputer in the world is running Linux. A couple of years ago, like a decade ago, that was a little bit different, but everything has basically converged on Linux. That's the only thing that matters. And ideally, these things are easy to use for scientists to do their research. That's not always the case today, because these, these systems are still quite complex. Um, and yeah, we're going way beyond classic HPC. We're now mostly talking about scientific computing. So HPC has been around for a very long time, since the 80s. Um, the picture you can see on the bottom left doesn't come from a Star Trek movie. This was an actual supercomputer in 85, a grade two. Um, and the picture doesn't show it, but when this thing was running, there was actually smoke coming out of it on top. So they liked making this thing sexy um, and looking, making it look very good. Things have evolved a lot since then. Um, what's nice to, to mention here is that we're seeing a 1,000x increase in compute power roughly every dozen or so years. So the, the smartphone you have in your pocket now used to be the supercomputer the size of a building um, 20 years ago. And that's important to realize that it's, it's, it's just moving really, really fast. Um, we're now getting very close to what's called the exascale era, where we're able to do 10 to the power of 18 floating point operations per second. And it actually, it takes longer to pronounce that than actually do that amount of, of calculations in a single second. So it's really insane. Um, traditional workloads are simulation, but modern workloads are way, way more diverse. Um, and we're still, for some parts of it, still, still stuck in the 80s or maybe a bit further. Like roughly half of the, of the time spent on supercomputers is on code written in Fortran. So a, a programming language that was invented in the 60s and has evolved a bit since then, but it's really still the same thing. 
And then a bit about the HPC user experience. Maybe this is not something to be proud of, but how you typically use a supercomputer is you SSH into it, you get a terminal window, and that's where you do your work. And that can be very challenging. If you're a bioinformatician and all you get is a black window with letters and you can't use your mouse, people are not very happy with that. And that's slowly starting to change. We're starting to see web portals um, through Open On Demand, for example, to have a, a bit more modern interface and maybe going a bit closer to what's happening in the cloud community. So things are definitely influencing each other there. Now we're, we're at KubeCon, so I have to mention containers. Um, containers are definitely also finding their way into HPC systems. Now, HPC is typically very slow in adopting new types of technologies, but containers are definitely there. Um, and that's mostly happening through the Singularity Project, which is now being renamed to Aptainer because of, uh, yeah, basically a fork essentially happened, and they, they are rebranding um, the community version of Singularity into Aptainer. Um, that works for a lot of people, but it still remains a challenge. So containers do work on HPC systems. You can't really use Docker. That's already one problem, so you have to use a different runtime like Aptainer. Um, and also leveraging all this special hardware that we have, the fast network, the GPUs, uh, shared file systems. So all of this can be a bit of a challenge when, when using containers. Um, this is a bit of a personal thing as well, but one thing I personally don't like about con using containers on HPC systems is that you're in some sense sacrificing performance to get mobility of compute. So what you typically do when you build a container image is you build it once and then you run it everywhere. That's the point of using containers. That doesn't really fit well on an HPC system because what you really want to do is optimize the software for the system on which it will be run. And that, that clashes pretty hard with how containers are typically used. Uh, what also doesn't help is that the hardware resources we have in HPC systems is getting more and more di diverse pretty quickly. So we're coming from an era where everything was basically Intel and AMD CPUs. Then NVIDIA GPUs came, and that was already adding some complexity. Now, now we also see ARM CPUs, and if you have your container image for x86, and you try to run it on ARM, you're not going to get very far. Um, and also for uh, GPUs, there's AMD GPUs coming, there's Intel GPUs coming, and this space is basically exploding, becoming way more diverse, and that's definitely an issue as well. The, uh, um, the explosion of workloads and different user profiles, bioinformaticians, physicists, and all types of scientists is definitely an, an issue as well. So they're not very familiar with containers at all, and it takes them a while to, to find their way around it. And also related to, to that last point, somebody will, build, will need to build the container image that the scientist needs. And it's quite possible that they are not able to do that. They are not able to figure that out, so somebody else has to do it for them. I'll pass the word back to, to Michael. Yes. So you might think that the container is the solution to this problem. So you would have a, and that's what we know as uh, people that are breathing containers. It's an immutable thing. You can change it, and then if it dies, you throw it away, and then it's the same again. Right? So you would start with a container image, which has Python. You add another layer on top of it, which has NumPy, Pandas, Scikit-Learn, whatever you need for your data science tools. And then you just add another layer, which has then the Jupyter Notebook images, which is like the IDE or interactive editor for the data scientist. So that's what he uses in his browser, which we will see in the demo later on. So, and you can pinpoint the versions, because if you want to re repeat an experiment, and if you want to repeat a demo, the usual mistakes that you have is, oh, nobody added a log file, and you're running into some different versions. And you can't repeat it because, oh, something's changed. Or you can't repeat it because you have a different processor architecture or whatnot, right? So that's the beauty of containers. Usually, you got, just can take them, you freeze them, and then you go wherever you want, and you get the same environment. So it seems like a pretty good solution, except for the user doesn't want just one version, but he wants multiple versions. So maybe your image recognition stack works with TensorFlow version, what is it, 2.5 or 2.6, because you have some dependencies. So, so suddenly you have two container images. 
Now factor in more libraries. One uses TensorFlow, the other one uses uh, PyTorch, Keras, whatever, you name it. And then you get to this combinatorial explosion which you suddenly cannot handle anymore, right? So is the container still the right solution for this or do I go back to my laptop and create not pet environments but, well, create pet environments, not cattle environments? Maybe we want to create a container that has it all, one container to rule them all, which can get very bloated, and you might run into issues with different versions. So you, you still, you, you might solve the multiple tools problem, but you certainly don't solve the multiple versions problem, unless you're doing some sort of hacks. Now, this is the current state of the art, right? So you're using a container, which is a base image, which has Python installed. Okay, I'm fine with Python 3x, most of the tools work there, so I still type in my pip install because that's what the data scientist knows. Um, fails, then maybe exclamation mark pip install, and suddenly it works because it's like a shell environment. I do my stuff, and then out of memory error, container restarts, boom. What happens? You start from scratch because the container just reboots and it, it's not persisted in there, right? So. And not just the non-persistent problem, but also it's just slower because you're installing stuff. And sometimes the libraries are not just interpreted, but you don't find a real file, a, um, a pre-compiled version, and you don't have a development, uh, a built environment inside your container. Right? So you cannot even install the stuff because it doesn't work. So the, the data science scientist experience is pretty much like, okay, I'm going back to my local machine, it works, because I'm not interested in operating any environments or administrating environments. I'm interested in getting my job done. So this leads to the pointy-haired manager management uh, nightmare. But luckily, we have a solution, a solution to it, which Kenneth will talk to. Yeah, okay, so th this issue of having lots of software that you need, um, people with different backgrounds who have different needs in terms of software, this is not new on an HPC system. This has been there for decades. So this, the solution we typically use is we install whatever software people ask for, but we install it in a non-standard location. For example, slash apps, so something outside of the regular Linux file system hierarchy. Um, Typically when we do this, we end up with hundreds or even thousands of different software installations, different versions of TensorFlow, different software packages, TensorFlow, PyTorch, R, all next to each other. Um, sometimes even built with different compilers because you may get different performance by, by just using a different compiler to install your software stack. All these installations are nicely separated. They each have their own unique directory under apps. Um, so it's a bit of a mess and it's not easy to find your way around. Um, what's also important is usually when we install software, we optimize it for the CPUs that we have in our supercomputer. So we don't just pull, we don't do just a yum install TensorFlow, let's say, because we know we'll get a binary that's a lot slower than it could be if it was properly compiled from source. So that's what we try to do. We build it from source, and we try to ensure to get good performance by using the, the CPU features that are available on the system. Um, and whenever people want to use additional software, they send us a request, and we just install something else in a separate directory. It doesn't bother everything else. It doesn't affect anything else. So you basically end up with an, a situation where you have your operating system, you have a shared file system, slash apps, which is mounted on all the nodes of the supercomputer, all the, all the worker nodes. Um, and in that shared file system, you have a whole bunch of software installations, everything next to each other, nicely separated. Now, that's good, but then how do you get your scientists to actually use that easily, right? Are you expecting to find their way around in this, in this mess? No, there's an, an easy way um, to expose um, the software stack to your end users. That's through um, a tool called environment modules. Um, so this is an, the traditional way of, um, I'm missing some pictures here, okay. This is the, the traditional way of giving users access to all that software you install centrally on the system. What they're basically doing is they're, they're loading or, yeah, they're loading module files that we create, and the module file expresses what has to change in the session environment to start using that software, and I'll, I'll give an example. 
Um, so they're, they're basically playing with a module command. They're doing module load, module avail to check what's available. Um, and that's all they really care about. They don't care how the software was installed. Um, they just talk to the module command, and, and that's enough for them. They don't care what's going on in the background. Today, there's, there's two main implementations of this mechanism. The original environment modules tools project, um, which, is most, which is implemented in Tickle. So that's a, a pretty old scripting language. Um, that was the original implementation. It, it was a bit unmaintained for several years, around 2010, 2015. It wasn't getting a lot of love because it was abandoned, abandoned essentially by the maintainer. But somebody new stepped in and he made it, he, he kept evolving it, made a new logo, so it's now an active project again. Um, while uh, the original project was dormant, another project emerged, LMOD, which is basically the same concept, but just implemented differently in Lua. It has some, some features that the original version doesn't have, and there's a, a mix and match going on. There are lots of, uh, of cross pollination between these projects as well. Now, the, the concept of environment modules was actually created in the 90s. So this is a, a screenshot of the original paper, and you can see the date here, June 1991. So this idea, this, this um, way of giving people access to software that's installed in a weird place has been there for 30 years. So this is very briefly how it works. Um, in the screenshot of the terminal, you can see the example command is not there. If we try to run it, it just fails. Um, we can, through the module command, we can activate a new set of modules that are available. So do module use on some location that we know where stuff is, is available. And then when we check for available modules, we can see there's a version of the example software available. We load this module, which just changes stuff in the background and the environment, and then we're ready to start using this example program. And all the user has to care is do module avail, module load, and ta-da, magic happens, and the software is suddenly working. On the right, you see um, what's actually in the module file that you're, uh, that you're loading. This is a, written in Lua, so it's written in a shell agnostic way. It's just expressing what has to change in the environment for the software to become available. And now, back to my co-speaker to explain you why this is relevant. So what Guillaume did, pull out his Highlander sword to the rescue and fought the battle of getting these modules into a single container image without bloating the image, right? So we could go away with just stuffing all this environment, which, is, uh, which uh, Kenneth just showed, and stuffing it into the image. But that's not fun because for obvious reasons. So instead of doing this, we have a read-only many volume in your cluster configured, which can be mounted from many parts many containers being spun up, and then you start your environment as a user. And user A starts his notebook image, user B starts his notebook image, and pulls in the same tooling that Kenneth just showed. And now, so the gods, the demo gods, the Highlanders, otherwise we blame them, are with us, with us we'll See how this works. Good. So this is um, the web page you would be confronted with if you are logging into your Open Data Hub environment. Or if you go to operatefirst.cloud to Open Data Hub, it looks similar. And then you click on launch your JupyterHub environment, which I pre-cooked for us. So you will be in a web-based IDE, basically. So our task as the data scientist is, OK, it loads. So I think we're good. Identifying dog breeds. This is a dog. It's Peter Snow. But which breed is it? So I would start my notebook, which a colleague provided to me. So he, he's sharing this notebook with me. It's just a file that I can upload into my Jupyter environment. And I say, OK, let's run all the cells, run all these blocks here. One works, second doesn't work. Man, what's that? Import torch vision. Seems to be that we don't have torch vision installed. So I'm going to this left-hand tab here. 
it's, it's a little bit like plugins for this IDE. So this is the module plugin. And I can see if my friendly administrator provided me with a Torch Vision module. So I type in Torch. So there seems to be Torch Vision. Great. Let's load. Oops. Thank you, Apple. Let's load it. And you can also click to one to um, on these on these tools and see whether it's the right one. So it gives you some some information about the module itself. So seems to be loaded. Loaded feature modules. Torch Vision is there. So let's rerun all the cells again. So the kernel needs to be restarted. It's basically restarting the Python interpreter. And oh, we get asterisks all the way down. Get the classes from Torch Vision works. Import warnings. Boom! It's a Leonberg with a 98% probability. Of course, we trust the AI. Good. I think that's that's the demo, right? We could start R Studio as well. Ah, the R Studio stuff. So, um, and we can go even further. So this is this is um, let's go back to the launcher here. Voila. So this is the environment um, that I can start with. I have a classical notebook with which, which we just saw. We have a terminal console, and we have an Elira distribution. But I can also load stuff like RStudio, which is a which is an environment for R, which is different than a notebook thing. And you might have an R background as a data scientist. So I just loaded the RStudio module. And voila, RStudio is available here. And I can click it like it's hot, and RStudio spins up if you're on a wired connection. And if your phone is tethered well, very well, and you're presented with a different work environment called RStudio. So without having a bloated container with a small container, you can extend your environment pretty easily. Good. Back to the slideshow. Voila. All right. So we, we've showed you that we basically have like an, an app store of pre-installed software that we can just dynamically load into our notebook um, and start playing. So how do we actually install this big um, set of, of software applications? For this, we used EasyBuild, which is a tool that's really focused on HPC systems. Um, so it was implemented for Linux special attention to performance, so lots of details that are specific to, to supercomputers, installing software from source, and so on. Um, it's an open source tool implemented in Python. It's been there for 10 years, but it's probably not really well known in the cloud community. Spe I guess because it was written for, um, for HPC. Now, EasyBuild not only installs the software, it also generates environment modules for you. Um, so you, when you do an, an, an EasyBuild installation of TensorFlow, for example, so you run the EB command, you run the EB command, it starts installing it. It will also create the module file for you. And then you're ready to go load TensorFlow and start playing with TensorFlow, figuring out if something is a cat or a dog. And this is really what was, what was being used to build this, um, this rocks volume that then is being mounted in the pod. So we have another short demo to give you an idea. Like, what if we want to add additional software um, into this volume that we're mounting? So we basically then go to our, let's say, build environment. This is the OpenShift cons web console. You have your pods running. And there we are on the ODH Easy Build pod. I see my details. I can click on Terminal. And voila, I'm presented with a terminal, which is oops, a little bit smaller, like this. All right. And here, I just have to make sure I start a bash login session. So my module command is available like this. So in here, I have my module command. I also have easy build. All right. 
And with the module commands, I can check if I have anything. TensorFlow installed. There should be a model for TensorFlow available in here. There's actually multiple. Um, so that's okay. So this is pretty ready to load. If I want to install something else, um, I can ask EasyBuild, for example, do you have or do you know how to install scikit-image? It's probably going to come back with a long answer for me. It knows about how to install scikit-image, a whole bunch of different versions, so you can pick one. Install this in this build environment, and then the module appears, and it's ready to go in the notebook environment. So it, it's pretty easy to install additional stuff dynamically, and it will just be straight away available in the notebook. You don't have to do anything else on that end. OK. And then I think we're running out of time, so we should start wrap up. Um, we also have some future work planned on this. So with EasyBuild, it's pretty easy to build your own software stack, whatever you want in there. Um, it's building from source, so that's going to take a bit of time. It's optimizing for the hardware on which you're building. So uh, you need to be a bit careful there that you're also starting your, um, your notebook on the same kind of hardware or things um, may become problematic. But we, we, can, we think we can do a little better than that. So rather than giving people a tool to install their own software stack, we think we can um, make a community project where we're essentially building a central software stack that works anywhere, regardless of the operating system that you're using, regardless of the type of CPUs that you're using, or even the specific subset of CPUs, Intel Haswell, Skylake, AMD Rome, whatever. Um, we know how to do this. And this is an, a new project, the European Environment for Scientific Software Installations. We basically want to give you Something like the ROX volume that you can just mount anywhere on your laptop, on an HPC system, in the cloud, in OpenShift, it doesn't really matter. Um, and we give you a bunch of modules that you can load and you can start playing straight away. So no installation time, everything properly optimized for the hardware on which you're going to run it, and so on. Now, I, I don't have the time here to really explain this in depth, um, but we have this layered approach where the, in the file system layer, this is what's responsible for distributing the software, and it does this in a very smart way. Um, it's only, it's basically Netflix for software. So as soon as you start loading a module and start actively using the software, it will actually be downloaded on demand in the background for you. And as an end user, you don't really notice. So you don't have to install anything. It's just being pulled in automatically. We have this compatibility layer in between. That's where we make sure that we can run on basically any Linux operating system. That could be a bare metal Linux or it could be Windows subset. Windows subsystem for Linux, and we're also looking at Mac OS and making sure that it can work there. And then on top here, in the software layer, we can install anything uh, that you want, TensorFlow, PyTorch, the whole world. Um, EasyBuild currently supports 2,500 different software packages without versions. We can install all of that in there and just ready for you to go um, and to start playing with it. Now, this is a very ambitious project, um, and we have some links at the end if you want to learn more about this. OK. Yeah, and really quick, so how this translates into the con container wor world, there are still some challenges and uh, quest open questions. So do we need such a compatibility layer, or do we get away with multiple base images? Um, how do we address this file system layer problem, um, read only, execute images distributed to all the clusters? Is that namespace, so how does RBAC work there? So there are some open questions, and there are some, some solutions to it, so, but it's um, yeah, not solved yet. And this is uh, the moment where you can take something home to try some, something out. Um, for OpenShift Data Science, the, this short URL, red.ht slash data science, will take you to a free tryout environment of um, the Rhodes products, so you can play around with this um, Open Data Hub as a service or go to Open Data Hub I.O. or to the Operate First Cloud. And you want to highlight some of the Highlander um, of the free easy builds? Yeah, so the links to easy build to the environment modules tools are there. Um, easy project, same thing. The last link there is a, is a pretty detailed paper that explains our idea and what we have in mind. And the last link is something I didn't mention, but the reason we really started the EasyBuild project is some of the scientific software is really messy to install. 
Um, it's not like a pip install TensorFlow and then it, it magically works. There's things that we have to build from source and literally spend days just to get it to compile and install. Um, and if you want to learn more about the type of problems we run into when doing that, you should check this YouTube talk. Um, so a recording of a talk I gave at, at FOSDEM a couple of years ago. Good. I think that's it. Do we have uh, still time for questions? So the Do AB we have any questions? Yeah, the AB guys are already out, so we don't know. We have one question. There's also one question over there. If I understood correctly, your, your built environment is the same container you use for the base uh, Jupyter. Yeah, basically, it spawn the same one and build on top, right? But yep. save the installation outside the container. Yeah, indeed. So the, yeah, the, the build environment please, that we please have. Please repeat the question. Oh, yeah. So the, the question was, is the build environment the same as basically the runtime environment where the notebook is running? Yes. So it's the same operating system. It's the same container, essentially. And then we're, we're using that same container to also run the software. And we have to. Like, we, 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 cannot, we cannot switch to a different container because then stuff may not work anymore. And that's where this idea of the easy project also comes in, to give you that flexibility to just jump to a different OS. It doesn't really matter anymore what your build environment was. We have ways of abstracting that away so the software can run anywhere. So that's like the next big step in, um, in this whole idea. And we had one question over, over here. And I think then we're also out of t time and we can take more questions here. Sorry. Um, first of all, thank you. Very nice talk, very interesting. Um, I wanted to ask you, how do you keep track of which version of the dependency people are using? Uh, in that case, you were importing TensorFlow, and there was just one, uh, just one uh, version. But I can imagine that you have multiple versions. And very often, the problem that we have is that people don't keep track of which version they are running uh, uh, the Jupyter Notebook with. Yes. So. Very good question. So the question was, how do I keep track on which version I am using in my, in my notebook? And I get it so like, OK, it doesn't work. So I just install the latest version of, from that drop-down, right? And then I'm running into the version hell and not into the dependency hell. So uh, you can export uh, or, or combine the modules um, that you used into a, how does Skium call it, a container or a, a, a collect, I think it's a collection. And then you can also copy and paste a little snippet of metadata into your notebook, so next time you execute all the cells, it will talk to the module environment and load all the versions. Think of it as a pip file lock for, for this uh, easy build module environment. So you can embed that into your notebook so that you can actually, if you're going to the same environment, you can click all cells, execute, and voila, it should work. And, okay. and another aspect there is when you're loading a TensorFlow module the way we install it, it has all the dependencies hard-coded in the module file. So it's always going to load the same version of Python, the same version of whatever other dependencies you have. So if you're loading the same module, you're getting the same software. Good. Uh, we, can, we, uh, we, we have time, so. And um, are you also planning to support spec? Planning to support spec in, well, you, you could do exactly the same with spec. So what we're using Easy Build now because, well, Guillaume was familiar with this already from his previous life, pre-Red Hat. Um, but you can do the same thing with any other tool. And you can combine, actually. It doesn't really matter. You can install modules with Easy Build, install modules with Spec, use pip. There's even a project that uses modules as a front end to containers. You could throw all of that in there and just combine stuff. Now, you probably have to be a bit careful what you combine, and there may be some issues there. But yeah, you can have multiple collections installed with different tools. That, that's absolutely fine. The same idea in, in the Easy project. We're focusing on Easy Build because we know that really well. But you could, the software layer, you can use any tool. You can use a bash script if you want to. It doesn't matter. All that matters is that the installations you get in the end have to be nicely separated. You need a module file to go along with it. But how that happens is irrelevant. OK. We have another question. Yeah, now, now that you say it with the versions in the Jupyter, is, are there plans to connect it to virtual env? Because that sounds like a cool solution, not combining it, at least. Yeah. 
that will make it specific. So the question was whether to combine it with virtual AMP, which is another environment solution and uh, uh, dependency solution management in the Python universe. Yeah, yeah so that, that would be specific to Python, and maybe it wasn't clear in the demo, but when loading the Torch Vision module, other stuff was being loaded that's not Python at all. Like FFmpeg is, in, I guess, an optional dependency for Torch Vision, and I'm not sure how you would bake that in a virtual AMP. Um, the, the beauty of environment models is that it, it could be anything. It could be C, C++ software with no Python front end. Yeah, it doesn't matter. Yeah, but that, that would make it just so sexy, right? That I have not a virtual environment where I have to install all my stuff, but it would point to easy build and all the goodies are installed with it. And I would only have it once on my system or remote instead of 20 different virtual ends. Yeah. So it, it, it's a more generic solution. It's basically the same idea, environment modules, but probably predates virtual env, and as far as I know, virtual env is specific to Python, so, yeah. Good, I, th I see people already leaving, so people let's, are hungry, let's leave so. it at that. Thank you for your attention and being here, and we're still here to talk. Right. About. Thank you, guys. Bye.